chapter 49. Like so many times in the book of Isaiah, we saw it in Ezekiel and also Jeremiah, God has to pronounce judgment on Jerusalem specifically, and we know why he does that. It's because they just will not give up their idols. They won't give up their stuff. They won't give up their sin. And we like wag our finger, we go, yeah, what a bunch of losers, oops, you know, but it could point right back at us, I think. God says, I wish people would just kind of read the word and and they would go, ding, oh, that makes perfect sense, I think I'll do that. But what happens is sometimes we kind of get hardened to God's word and uh, it's still a small voice, so God has to bring the two by four. God does not like bringing the two by four, breaks his heart. But in the midst of these judgments after judgments, quick on the heels is God's promises. We're going to see that tonight in chapter 49. I know how much you have suffered, Israel, but my Messiah will pay for all of those sins, and he's going to suffer even more. Chapters 49 through 57, a stubborn, selfish Israel will be restored through a selfless servant Messiah. Chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O coastlands. Those are nations over the sea. To them, more or less, it's, it's kind of an idea of all over the planet. Listen, O coastlands. Listen up, planet Earth. Listen to me and take heed. You peoples from afar. That's speaking of firmly right there, the people that are from afar. The Lord has called me Messiah. Now, you're going to see in this chapter, I, lots of I's and lots of me's and who is whom. I'll try to keep it straight for us. It's the Father speaking of Messiah. The Lord, notice capital L-O-R-N-D, there's Jehovah, has called me. Notice capital M. Because your translators knew that this was speaking of Messiah. Is Messiah God? Yeah, Isaiah chapter 9 settled that for us. He is this Messiah, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. The Lord, Jehovah, has called me, Messiah, from the womb, from the matrix. There it is in your New King James. The matrix is right there, the movie. It's far ahead of its time. Really, it's the womb, from the womb of my mother. This is a good place to write Psalm 22, verses 9 through 10. Um, You know that Psalm 22 is a videotape of the crucifixion. My hands and my feet, they have pierced. They're rolling dice for my clothing. Also, around verse 9 and 10, you, God, took me, Messiah, out of the womb You, God, made me, Messiah, trust while on my mother's breast. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Jesus had a mind for the Lord, a heart for his Father, even before he could practically cognize, I suppose, the words to express that. Prophesied here in Isaiah, also in Psalm 22. He, the Father has made mention of my name. That's Messiah. And he, the Father, has made my, or Messiah's, mouth like a sharp sword. Hey, that should ring a bell. Uh, Isn't Jesus going to dispatch all of the combatants hacking each other to pieces in the valley of Armageddon with what? We're a sword that comes out of his mouth. Revelation 19. Um, Also, isn't it said in Hebrews chapter 4, right around verse 12, that his word is sharper than any two-edged sword? Mm -hmm. Wow. Not only did Jesus' words cut to the heart of a matter, notice that he always had the perfect thing to say. And this is a prophecy of just that. In the shadow of, really protected by, his, the Father's hand. So there's the Lord, this is prophesying that when Messiah is going to do his thing, he is going to astound those listening and it's going to occur to them, how does he always have the perfect thing to say? 
Well, here you go. It's prophesied that he would. More details coming. Well, how does he do that? I'll give you a hint. Um, I love those who love me, and those who seek me early will find me. We're going to see here in a minute. I'm already burying the lead. Um, he's going to say, I'm going to give him the ear of the wise. Back to this prophecy of Messiah. In the shadow of really protected by the Father's hand, the Father has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. Um, you guys are not speaking of an arrow. Today you go get your arrows at uh, Mark Foreign and Strike or one of these places and you can count on that they've been laser leveled and because they're stamped out in a machine, they'll always be ramrod straight. How do they make arrows in these days? Well, they would hack them off of a, of a piece of wood. And all the wood, of course, no matter how tried, you try to get the straightest one you could, but all of the branches that you clipped off, they're going to have a little bit of a bent to it. And so the the person who either purchased the arrows or usually you made your own, you got very familiar with all of your arrows. And did you know that the skilled archman would pull out an arrow? It's not a generic arrow like we reach for, like Hawkeye does, you know. <laughs> Ours are going to have a little bend to it. And the, the, art, the archer pulls out an arrow. Oh yeah, I made this one a couple weeks ago and I know that it has a bent or tendency in this direction. And then the archer will pull down his aim and then of course he would allow for the bend of the arrow. This is an idea that the favorite arrow in the quiver, some are a little this and some are a little that, but I got this one right here. I call it the Terminator, you know. <laughs> you look down the down the shaft, and it's straight. It's straight. It's my favorite arrow. That's what's being referred to here. And he said, where'd I go? I lost my place. I was thinking about that arrow. His hand has hidden me. Uh, verse 3, he the Father said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, whom I have glorified. And then I, Messiah, said, I have labored in vain. Did you know that Jesus, of course, was fully God, but he was also fully human? And if you've ever sort of, it's ever crossed your mind, <laughs> is this making a difference? Does anybody really care? Did you know that Jesus, who was fully human, that thought sort of drifted through his mind, it would have seemed, and prophesied here. Then I, Messiah, have said or will say, What's it all for? It's not working. I've labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely I just, my just reward is with the Lord. Notice capital L-O. There's the Father and my work with God. This is especially true of Jesus Christ, but it's okay if you put your name in there. Messiah will one day certainly sort of think, wow. It sure looks like all of my efforts are for nothing. Nevertheless, here's how he always sort of ended, no matter what thought was moving through his mind. Nevertheless, I will trust that God is working, and I'll leave everything in his hands. This is perhaps one of the things that Jesus was thinking, maybe even on the cross. What's he doing there? He's paying for the sins of all mankind. What are his beloved fellow Jewish people, by and large, what are they doing? They're shouting stinging accusations. They're spitting in his face and they're plucking out his beard. It's possible that Jesus might have been mindful of Isaiah chapter 49, verse 4. Have I labored in vain? Have I spent my strength as he goes down to a knee, the cross beam across his shoulders. What would that have been like? Not only the loss of a great volume of blood, head spinning for lack of blood pressure, thirst. You can't carry the cross beam anymore. You falter to a knee. What might be going through your mind? Is it worth it? Have I labored in vain? Have I spent my strength for nothing? Yet surely, 
My just reward is with you, Father, and my work is in your hands. That's approximately when the Roman soldier taps, was it Simon of Cyrene? And says, how you help him. Keep reading the book of Acts, and you're going to find out that Simon's sons all are in the book of Acts. It would seem that Simon of Cyrene got saved that day. Anyway, verse 5. And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob? Do you remember Jacob and Israel? They're the same guy. Remember our story last week? When God changes a name from Abram to Abraham, he never says the former name before. Sarai to Sarah and a number of other locations. Only it's Jacob. Jacob means heel snatcher, if you will, salesman. I got this, I got this. God changes his name to Israel, governed by God. And it's kind of code, I think. Whenever you pick up the story on Mr. Jacob, if the, if the Holy Spirit prompts the writer to say Jacob, it's probably because he's behaving as a Jacob. But the other times he's referred to as Israel because he's probably acting as if he is governed by God. Here it's both. I know, the Lord says, who formed me, the Messiah, from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob <laughs> back to him so that what? Same guy. But his job is one day, because of Jesus' finished work on the cross, all of Israel will be saved. So that Israel is gathered to him, for I, Messiah, shall be glorious in the eyes of the Father, or Jehovah God. And my God shall be my Messiah's strength. Indeed, verse 6, he, the Father, says, Is it too small a thing that you, Messiah, should be my servant? To raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. Now we're sort of folding over into Bible prophecy. God knows that here at 700 BC, oh, Israel is a difficult student. That's putting it politely. God knows what's ahead. God spoke it in Deuteronomy 28. If you, Israel, obey my word, I'm going to be with you. And other people are going to say, look at those guys, how blessed they are. But when you don't, I'm going to pull back my hand of protection and all these terrible things are going to happen. And then people go, whew, I wonder whose God those guys are. And it's all there. And God knew that he was going to have to take them out of the land once. They come back under Ezra and Nehemiah. They re refuse Jesus on Palm Sunday. He takes them out again, 70 AD until 1948. They're back in the land. Whee! But God knew about that. It's all there in Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37. What about these dry bones? Can they be made to live? Ah, they're pretty dry, Lord. Thou knowest. Speak, prophesy, and so he does. And they came together as a as a bunch of inanimate bodies just standing there like little, little robots with no hard drive. But they're not moving, Lord. I know. There's no breath in them yet. Prophesy to the breath. You know the story. So I prophesied in the spirit, the Ruach of God came in them and they suddenly woke up. That's a prophecy that when Israel comes back to the land, a year in front, 1946, 1947... Certainly 1945, when almost six million of them have died. You think they'll ever be a nation again? I don't know, Lord. Look at that. They look like a big valley of dry bones. Can these bones be made to live? I don't know, Lord. They come together. That's 1948. Miracle. But there's no breath in them yet. That doesn't happen until the midpoint of the Great Tribulation. They've been calling the Antichrist the Messiah for the first three and a half years. Halfway in, what, is the, what, is their, um, what does the Antichrist do, their Messiah? He then changes his mind. He says, y'all get out of the temple that I just gave you. And he puts a statue of himself there. Now everybody's got to worship me. And if you don't, off with your head. Gulp, says Israel. You're not our Messiah. 
That's when the blindness in part is removed from the nation of Israel. Individually, any Jewish person can get saved like anyone else can, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But as a nation, God is seeing to it that the leadership, and even to some degree the religious leadership, won't see Jesus as Messiah. They had their chance, April the 6th, 32 A.D., to receive Messiah. And he did everything he could. He's standing on the Mount of Olives, you know. Where did the glory of the Lord depart? Mount of Olives. It's right back. He's standing there 173,880 days to the day that Daniel said he would be standing there. Oh, what's he riding on? An Uber. He's riding on a donkey. That's Zechariah 9, verse 9. He's there on a Sunday when they're supposed to select their Passover lamb. It's like God is screaming, I'm totally the Messiah. No, you're not. That's why Jesus stopped that day, the whole parade, and he began to weep over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, if you would have only known what day, singular, this is. But because you haven't, there's nothing more I can do. I was raising people from the dead, walking on water, healing people like crazy, and that's not enough for you. Had authority over demons, and you called me, yep, best because you're the, you're the honcho of demons. You're Beelzebubba. <laughs> right, Dan? Bubba. There's nothing more I can do for you. So God says, I'm going to put a blindness in part over the nation of Israel. 70 AD, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and all the Jews are scattered all over the world. For the next 19 centuries, they ran in fear of their very lives. They really did. Coming to perhaps a bit of a zenith in the pogroms and the concentration camps and the, the gas chambers of just awful. There's actually a prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 20 that says they're so fearful. They're like at night, oh, I wish it were morning, you know. Then when it's morning, oh, I wish it were night. What a terrible way to live. That's all part of what God is prophesying here. And still Israel won't bend the knee that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. While the gavel of the UN falls, they become a nation May 14th, 1948. So they come together. There's your Ezekiel, the dry bones, and they're a body, but there's no breath in them. It's going to take the Antichrist antics for them finally to go, Ding, you're not a Messiah, our Messiah, which means, and don't forget, Moses and Elijah have been in Jerusalem telling them about the Bible. There's, there's Moses. I'll tell you what the first five books of the Bible mean because I wrote them. <laughs> And for three and a half years, they're all, la, 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 we're not listening to you. And then they're killed about that time. And then they supernaturally ascend themselves, going out, told you, you know. <laughs> and then the Antichrist does what he does, puts a statue of himself. God pulls back that blindness in part, and suddenly they see it. Jesus is our Messiah. Zechariah 12, verse 10 kicks in. And they will look upon me whom they pierced. When was Jehovah God pierced? And they're going to mourn from the kings all the way down to the lowest class people. And they're going to cry out for Jesus. That's when God says, now, that's about the time the Antichrist puts that statue. If you're in Jerusalem, if you're a Jewish person, what do you got to do? Get out now. Get to Petra. I don't know if I can say this with all certainty, but I have a hunch. It's a ever sort of focusing picture. If you don't believe Matthew chapter 24, right around verse 15 and following, and you didn't listen or don't listen to Jesus' warnings, and you go, oh, it's not a big deal, and you don't get to Petra, where God is supernaturally protecting his people, I think the Antichrist now then turns all of his mega military might and all of his snooping and sniffing things. You can't buy or sell without the mark, all of that stuff. And he systematically tries to hunt down every Jewish person he can and kill them. Zechariah chapter 14 says two thirds of the Jews will be killed during that time. 
Why? Because they still didn't listen to Jesus Christ and they didn't get to Petra. All that is to say, it's the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, ding, that they finally say Jesus is our Messiah. Then finally, the last three and a half years transpired, Jesus comes back to the planet. The first thing he does is he goes after those trying to kill the remnant of Israel in Petra. He brings them out. We're with Jesus on a horse. Off we head to the Valley of Megiddo. We don't have to fight, you guys. Jesus just says a word. My hunch is, I am. And all the combatants die. One more time, verse 3. <clears throat> Pardon me, verse 5. And now the Lord, the Father, who formed me, Messiah, from the womb... When was Messiah going to be born of a woman? Here is one of the things right here. Who formed me, Messiah, from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I, Messiah, shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, the Father, Jehovah, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he, the Father, says, Is it a small thing that you, Messiah, should be my servant? To raise up tribes of Jacob? To restore the preserved ones? This is the remnant. These, I believe, is referring, he is referring to those Jews who are now outside of Petra, running all over the planet, trying to hide from the Antichrist. I will also give you, Messiah, as a light to the Gentiles. This probably was a real head-scratcher to the rabbis. Ooh, we hate Gentiles. Do you know if you brushed up against one, you were considered unclean, you know? Thanks a lot. By the way, what was some of the reason that God made Israel? To be a model. Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles on how to find God. Uh, how'd it work out? They will one day, but not for a while. As a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my, the Father's salvation to the ends of the earth. Originally, Israel's original mission was to be a light to the whole world. But now, not wanting to be polluted by the heathen Gentiles, Israel lost its compassion and vision for all non-Jews. By the time Jesus shows up, they didn't want to touch one. The nation of Israel failed her mission. She's going to pick up the story again in the, in the Great Tribulation, the last half of the Great Tribulation, and certainly in the millennial reign. Jesus Christ is the true Jewish person. He, Jesus, never lost sight of that calling to be a light to the Gentiles. His life was a light, and he died to save how many humans? All of mankind. Verse 7. Thus is the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, and to him, Messiah, whom man despises. To him, Messiah, whom the nation abhors. We hate this guy. To the servants of the rulers. This is um, one of the titles of Messiah. The servant of rulers. We know that there's lots of uh, monikers about the Messiah. He's the rod of Jesse. Uh, many, many descriptions. A lot of people miss this one. One of the descriptions of the Messiah, he is the servant of rulers. Right in your margin here, Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Uh, do I have to turn there? You guys remember what it is, right? Paul is writing and saying, all rulers are there because God wants them there. And we've been talking about this for a while, especially with the whole mask thing and the COVID thing. Oh, was that a sticky wicket? And it still is. There are some Christians putting their foot in the ground saying, I don't have to do a thing that my governor wants me to do. I didn't vote for him anyway. What does Romans 13 say? You have to obey the rulers that are in authority because not a one of them is there except that God put them there. A lot of people got really uncomfortable with that, especially when we pointed it out, when it went against their sort of political, sort of, what would that be? I want to say the direction of their political fur. 
You ever rub the dog the wrong way? They're like, hey, stop that. <laughs> Notice, would you, one of the titles of Messiah is, quote, the servant of the rulers. Don't miss this. Jesus will someday soon rule all of heaven and earth. But before the Father gives him all things, his first time here, he was under the authority of his rulers. Case in point, you get to about Matthew chapter 26, and there's Jesus being tossed about between Caiaphas and Annas and Pilate's house. And they get to Caiaphas' house, the high priest, and he's not responding. Are you the Messiah? And he wouldn't say anything. That was also prophesied. He would, as a sheep is dumb before it shears, he would say nothing. But then somebody said, then the, the high priest says, in the name of the Lord, you speak to me, the high priest. Are you the Messiah? Little different circumstances because he was, quote, the servant of rulers. Jesus, that's his first response. It is as you say. Why did he say that to Caiaphas when Caiaphas played the I'm the high priest card? Because Jesus is fulfilling Isaiah chapter 49. It is as you say. Though under authority at his first advent, when he returns, watch this next little section. All leaders, all nations will be under Jesus' authority. There's Pilate. You'd better tell me something. Don't you know that I have the power to kill you, Mr. Jesus guy? What did Jesus say? Not be the smarty. He's saying, you don't really have any authority at all except that my father gives it to you. He's all, don't. Kings shall see and arise. Princes shall worship because of the Lord, the Father, who is faithful and the Holy One of Israel. And he has chosen you, Messiah. That day is coming. I couldn't help it. Um, just listen, if you would. You know this verse. It's Philippians 2, verse 10. And says Paul, Jesus being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. You know that story. Even the death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, how many knees are going to bow? Every knee is going to bow. Of those in heaven, those on the earth, and those under the earth. Who are those guys? Those are your fallen demons in the abuso. And that and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here it is also prophesied in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time, God's saying when it's the perfect time, and I wrote my margin, Revelation 19, when it's the right time, I have heard you, the Father is saying to his Messiah. And in the day of salvation, I, the Father, have helped you. Now, when Jesus is suffering on the cross, let's take a quick sort of revisit. What's happening? He has been scourged across his back. He has been beaten with fists. His beard has been plucked out in splotches and they're spitting on him psalm 22 gives us more to the story the bulls of bashan have surrounded me you have to do a little digging but the bulls of bashan is a reference to demons where was lucifer on or around the crucifixion time can't see for sure but i'll bet he's right here it's coming out of the human's mouth if you're the messiah come down he saved others, why can't he save himself? Some of those humans, what's being prompted to come out of their mouths was inspired by the imps and demons chortling with glee. Jesus, who could send them to the abuso with the word, is now in that state? 
They're joining in. They're piling on. In the acceptable time, when it's God, God's timing, probably Revelation 19. I have heard you, Messiah, in the day of salvation. What's the day of salvation? I kind of think that's a reference of when he saved us. Calvary. I, the Father, have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth. The millennial reign, he's going to restore the earth. To cause them, Israel, to inherit the desolate heritage. Um, God is going to allow um, Jerusalem specifically to be sacked and destroyed on several occasions. And even in the last half of the Great Tribulation, Jerusalem is going to take heavy damage. God's going to fix that. God's promised land, wrecked by war in the Great Tribulation, verse 9, that you, Messiah, may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. This makes no sense, I believe, until you can sort of think of the cross. I believe these, this verse and a couple more to come, I believe is a videotape inside the heart and the mind of Jesus the seven-year tribulation will see the Antichrist hunt down and kill two-thirds of all Jews. Revelation 19, Jesus returns and calls, Come out from hiding. You've been racing and scattering all over the world trying to escape the Antichrist's wrath. He's done. Come out. Come home. It's time. Time for believing Israel to be what they were created to be. Remember, too, Zechariah 8, verse 23, says that during the millennial reign, 10 men will grab the sleeve of one Jewish man. Oh, please, please tell us of this wonderful Messiah who now at this time is living on the planet. That's the near fulfillment. Pardon me, that's the far fulfillment. What's the near fulfillment? I believe it's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Before Jesus ascended, we saw that Acts chapter uh, 3, uh, pardon me, Acts chapter 1. Before he ascended, Jesus first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He preached. He led captivity captive. We know what that means. Before the cross, you still couldn't be in the presence of a holy God. So God made for them a, a special and separate place called paradise. After the cross, all sin is paid for. Jesus is going to go to that paradise. He, it's described in Luke chapter 16 that there's a great gulf fixed between. He's going to go to paradise and say, Abraham, David, Moses, I'm the promised one. Hey, Isaiah, yes. Oh, Isaiah, yes, Lord. You were writing about me. All sin has been paid for. Let's go. He led captivity captive. To those on the other side of the gulf, the great gulf fixed, they have to stay there in flame and torment. They see it. Everybody is leaving. To cause them, Israel, to inherit the desolate heritages I'm going to fix Jerusalem and the promised land. That you, Messiah, may say to the prisoners, let's get out of here. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Let's go. Verse, continuing in verse 9. And they, Israel, shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. This is in the millennial reign. Verse 10, they shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither shall heat nor sun strike them. Some of them have survived the last three and a half years of the great tribulation. One of the judgments is scorching heat from the sun. Not anymore. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. There's your Messiah. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. I believe this is a reference to the Jews who had suffered through the Great Tribulation. Verse 11, I will make each of my mountains a road, no more obstacles. Um, you put a couple of verses together, the massive earthquake, the one that's the worst earthquake that ever was and never will be, happens right around Revelation chapter 16 at the midpoint. 
I believe part of that is, oh, by the way, guess what the new highest mountain on the planet will be? It won't be Everest. It'll be Zion. And I'm going to shake and rattle down all of the mountain passes. Read that. I'm going to make it really easy for everyone to get to Jerusalem. Verse 11, I will make each of my mountains a road and my highway shall be elevated Surely these shall come from afar. Look, these from the north and the west and those from the land of Sinem. In the millennial reign, God is going to rebuild and repair God's perfect earth. And I couldn't help it too. Right here, right, Revelation 7, verse 16. They're talking about the same thing. Let me read Revelation 7. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. Hey, that's what Isaiah is talking about. They're seeing the same thing. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Verse 13. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and bring out in, break forth in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people, Israel, and will have mercy on his afflicted. The, the creation is going to get healed too. Right in your margin here, Romans 8, verse 22, where Paul says, currently, all of the creation, quote, groans waiting to be restored. Planet Earth is way broken, and if you will, it knows it. And it remembers, speaking anthropomorphically, it remembers what, oh, we used to look like before the animals ate each other, before all of the sin have wrecked and ravaged the creation. Verse 14, but Zion, those people living in Jerusalem, they said, the Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. I believe this is predicting the Babylonian captivity. I think now we're moving to a more near fulfillment. And this, I believe, right in your margin here, Psalm 137, verse 13. Uh, let me read that to you. If you remember the story, the Jews are deported out of Jerusalem. They've been conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. And when they get to Babylon, their captors, they say this. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. This is Psalm 137, verse 3. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, Jerusalem. It's a smoking heap now. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. We're not playing music anymore. For there those who carried us away, captives, our Babylonian overlords, asked us to sing a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing to us, sing to us those beautiful songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I believe Isaiah 49 verse 14 is prophesying that thing. But the people living in Jerusalem, the Lord has forsaken me and the Lord has forgotten me. Verse 15 you have maybe forgotten me, but I will never forget you. Verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child? Inference, well, no. And not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget. In other words, even if they do, it's rare. Yet I will not forget you, Israel. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls, Jerusalem, are continually before me. If you didn't know, there's a group of people, and even people who call themselves Christians, who believe that God got so mad at Israel that he said, forget you, Israel, I'm done with you, you're done. And I'm going to take all the promises earmarked for Israel, I'm going to give them to the church. There are people that really believe that. It's called replacement theology. Have they not read this verse? The Israel's hands are tattooed. Pardon me, Israel's name, the people, the Jewish people, are tattooed on the hands of the Lord. What do you do with your hands? You do everything. It's a notion of no matter what I'm doing, there I see my people, Israel. 
This is about as strong language and sentence structure as you can construct. I will never forget my people. Do you see why replacement theology isn't good scholarship for one thing? Verse 17, your son shall make haste. This is millennial reign again, I believe. They're gonna come back near fulfillment. Maybe the, the end of the exile of Babylon, Ezra, Nehemiah, etc. But the far fulfillment, and then 1948, of course, but the far fulfillment will be when Jesus arrives. Your son shall make haste. They're going to come back. Your destroyers and those who laid you away shall go away from you. They're not going to be hanging out anymore. Lift up your eyes. Look around and see all these gathered together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. Oh, far from forgetting his people. I'm going to bring you back into the promised land. And watch this. In a minute, kings and queens of other nations are going to fall at the feet of the Jewish people. In fact, as we're going to read here in a minute, even the Gentiles are going to help them get back to Jerusalem. Watch this, verse 19. For your waste and desolate places and the land of your destruction will even now be too small for the inhabitants and those who swallowed you up, they're going to be gone. We'll be far away, verse 20. The children you will have after you, I believe this is referring to those Jewish people who survived the great uh, tribulation. After you have lost the others, will, in other words, you, you, you lost kids during the great tribulation, will say again in your ears, this place is getting too small. Give me a place where I can dwell. In the millennial reign, so physically restored and healthy will be the humans, so verdant the land, no enemies to threaten them, no diseases, the Jewish population is going to explode. Verse 21. Then you will say in your heart, where did all these kids come from? <laughs> Who has begotten these for me? My family's growing so fast. Since I have lost my children, I am desolate. I believe this is referring to those Jews who survived the terrible onslaught of seeing two-thirds of the living Jews at the time being exterminated. Those who survive are going to go, many of my own kids and family are gone. But in a minute, so to speak, in the millennial reign, they're going to look around and say, where did all these kids come from? I remember when I lost my children and I was desolate. I remember when I was a captive and I was wandering to and fro. And who has brought these? Where'd they come from? They look great. And there I was, left alone. But these, where were they? The near fulfillment of this passage could be referring in a small sense to those returning from the Babylonian exile. Perhaps those returning in 1948 uh, from the Holocaust, of course, they saw many the same thing, but this ultimately will be in the millennial reign. Verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand in an oath to the nations. Gentiles are going to help you. I'm going to set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons and your arm in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. The Gentiles are going to foot the bill for y'all getting back to the promised land. Verse 23, kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust from your feet. Oh my. The former Gentile honchos are now serving the Jewish people. Then you, Israel, will know that I am the Lord. For they, those who trust me, shall not be ashamed, those who wait for me. God is saying, today, Israel, you don't see the whole picture. And it looks rough. Can you imagine reading these verses to those in the concentration camps? Those being tossed out of Europe 
Spain and so on. Edicts of expulsion, one after the other. It might seem a little funny, huh? But it's going to happen. God is saying today, Israel, you don't see the whole picture, but I do. All you see are the immediate obstacles. But I see way down the road, it's going to happen. I'm going to bring you back. In fact, there's going to be so many of you, and so prosperous will you be, that the restored promised land is not going to seem big enough. <laughs> Verse 24. Shall the prey be taken by the, from the mighty? Big strong guy takes down a deer. He's dragging it to his pot, you know. You want to try to grab that from him? I don't think so. Or the captives of the righteous be delivered? In human terms, we'll know. But this says the Lord. Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away because I'm going to do it. And pray, and the prey of the terrible was going to be delivered, for I will contend with him who contends with you. And I will save your children. I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh. And they shall be drunk with their own blood. Perhaps a reference to the battle of Armageddon. All flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. God's going to break all the bonds. He's going to free all the slaves from the mightiest of tyrants. In the natural, I think this is fully formed, probably soon after he returns, Revelation 19. The supernatural can happen today. What do you mean? With the power of sin and demonic realm defeated by the cross, if I'm filled with the Spirit, Paul says... I will not gratify the flesh. This freedom from the tyrants of addictions, depression, doubt, and fear, that can happen to any of us right now. Amen, you guys? I love that. Next chapter, let's see what happens. Chapter 50, thus says the Lord, hey, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, Israel? In other words, all the... All the awful adulteries with all those countless idols. Show me where I divorced her. What's this inferring? He never did. Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce whom I have put away? There is none. Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? I mean, I could really sell you. There is none. There aren't any. For your iniquities, you have sold yourselves. I never wanted you to leave my home or my heart. Y'all the ones who left. I never left you. And for your transgressions, your mother has been put, but really taken away. She led herself into those judgments. Verse 2. Why, when I came, was there no one? I was looking around my own home, as it were, my own Jerusalem, and there was nobody there who had a heart for me. Why, when I called, was there no answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Of course not. Or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, with my rebuke, I could dry up an ocean. I can make rivers into a desert, even so that the little fishies are stink because there's no water. Verse 3, I clothe the heavens with blackness. And I make sackcloth. Really, those are the scratchy things that you wore when you were mourning. I make that their covering. Verse 4. The Lord God has given me, Messiah, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. How did Jesus know how to say and do the right thing? Here is your answer. Because the Lord God... The Father has given me, Messiah, the tongue of the learned, that I will know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. How do you do that? Here's a hint. He, the Father, awakens me, Messiah, early in the morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Right in your margin here, Mark chapter 1, verses 32 and 35. We've got a quick minute. I want to show you what this means. Go ahead and turn there to chapter, uh, book of Mark, chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
Mark chapter 1, please. I want to show you where this actually takes place. Mark chapter 1, just with your eyes, this is the first part of Jesus' ministry here. Uh, look down at verse number 21. So they all showed up into Capernaum. Uh, this is where, very near where Peter lived. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he taught. Well, that's going to take a couple hours. Skip down to verse number 29. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon. Um, he cast out a demon there. Remember, there was a whole de demonic fracas there. He cast out the demon. And then now, verse 29, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon, Peter's mom, uh, lay sick with a fever, and they told her, and they told him about her at once, verse 31. So he came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. So now he's working there too. Verse 32. At evening, ah, he put on his slippers and he turned on dun -dun -dun, dun -dun -dun, ESPN, right, Mike? That's what he did. Watch what happens in the evening when you should be sort of winding down. Big day, you know, big day. Verse 32. At evening when the sun had set, they, the people of Capernaum, brought to him all who were sick. They must have heard about the Peter's mom thing. Remember how I told you on Sunday, if there's a real bona fide ministry of healing going on, humans are going to come out of the woodwork and they are going to flock. Well, they do so. All who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. So in the, uh, be healed, be healed, and then brah, come out in the name of Jesus. And some are worse than others, remember. That's a battle. I don't know if you've ever dealt or ministered to someone who is definitely demon-possessed, but it's an exhausting exercise. Verse 33, and how much of the city? Whole city was gathered together at the door. How long would it take to pray for everyone in Capernaum? I think it's going to take a while. I would hazard a guess well into the evening. Maybe even late evening. Possibly into early morning. Verse 34. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, cast out many demons, and he, he did not allow the demons to speak because he knew them. Now in the morning, he was ministering all day. It started in the synagogue. Then he's traveling with the boys and they make it to Peter's house. He's got to work there too. He heals Peter's mom. Then after dinner, how much of Capernaum showed up? And he ministered to them all. Now the next day, Steve slept in. Because that was a big day of ministry. Watch Jesus. Now in the morning, having risen, say it with me, a long while before daylight... He, Jesus, went out and departed to a solitary place where he prayed. Why was he so effective? Right in your margin here, Isaiah 50, verse 4. How did he do that? This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. If Jesus says stoner, well, then he's going to lose all of his audience. But if he tries to placate to the audience and say, don't stone her. Well, only we got him, you know. I'm breaking the law. We're so smart. What are you going to do, Mr. Messiah man? You wrote in the dirt. You know the story. You are without stone. Sin, you go ahead and throw the first stone. They drop them one by one. Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? Well, she's obviously an eyewitness. Where are her accusers? They're gone. The law requires two to convict. Jesus was well within the law. Then neither do I convict you. Go and sin no more. How does he do that? Right here. Right here, right? Isaiah 50, verse 11. He, the Lord, awakens me, Messiah, morning by morning, and he teaches me. He teaches me, and the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. Also right here, Proverbs 8, verse 17. I love them that love me, says the Lord. And those who seek me early will find me. Back to Isaiah 50. Let's scoot to the end. This is how and why Jesus 
always said and did the right thing. Now verse 5, Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me. We are now going to see a videotape of the crucifixion. 700 BC, this is describing John 18, verse 22. What did they do to Jesus' back? They reduced it to ribbons. My cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. Matthew 26, verse 62. I did not hide my face from shame and what? There it is. There it is. Oh, loved one, you may not remember all the specifics, but hopefully you're putting it together. Bible prophecy is one of the strongest reasons to believe in Jesus Christ. And here's another one. The book of Isaiah is predicting scourging, plucking out of the beard, and the spitting. All the descriptions of Jesus' beatings are right here. Now let's see what might have been going through Jesus' mind when all that was happening. Verse 7, for the Lord God is going to help me. I believe this is an a little peek into the heart of the Lord. When all of these horrible things are happening, he's getting beat and spit on. Maybe this was what Jesus was thinking. Whack! Whack! Pull the beard out. Punch in the face. Whack! The Lord God is going to help me. Whack! Punch! Punch! Rip, spit. I will not be disgraced. Bulls of Bashan, the demonic, you're not doing it right. I will not be disgraced. I have set my face like flint. Whack. I know that I will not be ashamed. Punch. He, my father, is near. He is near who justifies me. Punch, whack, clang. The hammer hits the nail. Clang. He is near who justifies me, who will contend with me. Someday, this is all going to be worth it. The cross, kerklunk, settles in the ground. Let us, the Father and Jesus, stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. There's the bulls of Bashan, demons and Lucifer here at the cross. Surely the Lord will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Let they, those abusing their authority, God-given authority, Pontius Pilate, at all. Surely the Lord will help me. Let he who will, con who will condemn me, indeed they, those people that think they're in control, they are going to all grow old like a garment. The moth are going to eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Clang! Punch! If you're really Messiah, come off the cross. What happens at the third hour? The light goes away. Everything is plunged into darkness. You remember that, right? That's in Matthew 27, verse 45. Three hours of terrible darkness. Watch this. Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Right down to the darkness. Verse 11, look all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire and the sparks that you have kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You're going to lie down in torment. This is God saying potentially that those who kindled a fire while it was dark 
Jesus still on the cross. Some of you are huddling in fire. Isn't this darkness kind of weird, you know? And what are they telling each other? Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know, maybe somebody didn't pay the light bill. I don't know what it was. But the point of it is, if you don't find salvation in Jesus Christ and you're patting yourself on the back, Proverbs 14, verse 12, there's a way that feels right to a man, but the end thereof is what? Death. If you don't take this cross and this darkness and my bleeding, battered, beard, plucked out body and you don't receive me, you will find your home in Sheol. Torment. Let's all stand. Lord, I want to thank you for the Bible. The Bible is fun to read and to study. Tonight was a little rough, or I should say perhaps sobering. Fascinating that people, myself included at times, I get bummed and I get discouraged. And a little part of me says, what's the use? Thank you, Lord, for Isaiah chapter 49 and chapter 50. It happens. We, like Jesus, have to hold on to the notion that he who is in charge of all things is near me. And he's letting it touch my life. Don't run. Stay within the shadow your name is on his hand. And it's all for a purpose. And soon and very soon, loved one, the millennial reign is coming. And soon after that, the new Jerusalem. Hang in there, harvest. Stay with it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Uh, we'll see you on Sunday. God bless you.